I took a look at the first line in this morning's scripture, which is on the last day of the festival, and you know what happened. Festival of what festival? Lost complete track of what the message was in the scripture and had to look up festivals. In John, they are celebrating what is called the Festival of Booths, as in phone booth. <laughs> ah, I'm sorry, not the best analogy. Uh, some of us have been around long enough to remember what a phone booth was anyway. Uh, today, that festival is called Sukkot. Historically, Sukkot commemorated the 40-year period during which the children of Israel were wandering in the desert. Agriculturally, Sukkot is a harvest festival. And coincidentally, Sukkot begins today. So, back to the scripture. The Gospel of John. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. And let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Marvin, so much. I had watched Marvin on the website, and I knew he would introduce the scripture beautifully. Well, I am so grateful to Ken Markin, the chair of your staff parish relations committee, and to Reverend Jeff Rainwater, your district superintendent, for the invitation to me to come out of retirement to serve First United Methodist Church. You may know that I retired several years ago from a congregation in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, just south of Denver. At the time I retired, I wondered how I would do. You know, I wondered how I would do in retirement. I remembered an earlier time in the mid-1990s when the bishop asked me to leave my congregation in Grand Junction. I was assigned to lead all of the corporate ministries of all of our churches in the four state region. Well, with that appointment, I became a bit depressed. I thought I would shrivel up and die as a church bureaucrat. I thought I would miss the simple joys, Easter sunrise in the snow, <laughs> and candles on Christmas Eve, and the smell of burning hair, <laughs> and infants wet from baptism, or whatever, <laughs> and a pulpit. Well, I ran into a colleague just a few weeks after the new appointment was announced, and he invited me to come to his church in Salt Lake City. He said, Janet, will you come and lead us in a planning retreat to help us dream new dreams? And then, almost as an aside, he said, and oh, by the way, would you preach for us on Sunday morning? I was so over joyed that I lost all decorum. I kissed the man. <laughs> Robert turned red from the tips of his toes to the top of his bald head. And when he found his voice again, he said, you don't have to blow in her ear. Just let her preach and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> Again, I am grateful to Reverend Jeff and to Ken for this invitation to be with you. And I am grateful that most of our conversations were through electronic mail. And so I did not embarrass myself or Jeff or Ken with an enthusiastic kiss. 
Please know that I will hold you forever in my heart as a community that welcomed me and entrusted to me this holy enterprise. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, help us to become masters of ourselves that we might be servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Well, I have a colleague, the Reverend Sally Subi Long. When she learned that I was coming to Casper, she told me how much I was going to love this city. Sally had been one of the leaders of uh, Leadership Wyoming, one of the facilitators of Leadership Wyoming, and she got to know Margaret and Merritt Benson and Reverend Bill Moore very well. Well, this picture hangs in Sally's office today, and I call this fellow Sally's goat. You'll hear about Sally's goat because Sally always reminded me to listen to emotions in times of change. Well, I'm feeling full of feelings this morning. My Forbes family relatives live down east in North Carolina. They happen to live on the Cape Fear River near Wilmington and on the Noose River near New Bern. The name Florence is a name that my family will remember for many years to come. I found a card from my husband, Bob, just yesterday. Now, he will be joining me here in Casper in a couple of weeks. It's a 25th anniversary card that I put in my Bible two years ago, and I found it yesterday. It's easy to fall in love with a cute face, a sweet voice, and a gentle touch. It takes longer to learn how someone shows everyday moments of support or handles tough situations. Oh my, so tender, and I miss him. And I am very aware this morning that Pastor Brian spoke from this platform, from these steps, and I feel his presence mightily. The grief over his loss is palpable and wounding for many of you. So when I looked down this week, I discovered that I had nothing to hang on to, absolutely nothing. I realized that we are Sally's goat leaping across a chasm of change, and it is a long, long way down. Not only do I feel like that goat, but I know the name of the river at the bottom of those canyon walls. The Salmon River in Idaho is called the River of No Return. When raptors put into the water, no one gets to turn around. With canyon walls that go up as much as five thousand feet. This 200 mile stretch of the river is a one-way street. You are committed to the ride. Now William Bridges in his book Managing Transition says it isn't the change that does us in, it's transition and they aren't the same thing. Change is situational. Transition is psychological. It's a process that we go through to come to terms with a new situation. The first phase of transition is letting go of the former ways and helping one another deal with loss. It's about grief, that roller coaster of feelings, anger, shock, sadness, blame. Denial, phase one. The second phase is the time between times, the time where the old is gone but the new isn't fully formed yet. Bridges calls this time 
the neutral zone. It's the gap. It's the hanging in midair. And the third phase is coming out of the transition and making a new beginning. Transitions start with an ending, and they end with a beginning. And trans transitions usually take about 12 months to unfold. As your interim senior minister, I will join your leaders in guiding this transition, more formally what I would call the neutral zone, the gap, the time between times. I will serve for nine months or until a new senior pastor is named. I will be a temporary pastor, a resident consultant, and a partner in your mission to celebrate, connect, and serve from the heart of Casper. The writer of the Gospel of John gives Jesus the image of a river to express hope in times of change, hope as they enter the harvest festival. During the festival of booze, water is poured out at the altar to remind everyone of the water that God provided when the people in the desert were very thirsty. Jesus boldly claims that he can satisfy that inner thirst. Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus' spirit not only fills us up, but it flows out of us. Not only do we receive blessings when we follow Jesus, but we become a blessing to others. Today, when we go to Israel, when you go to the Holy Land, one of the things that we want to see is the River Jordan. Uh, for not only was it crossed by Joshua militarily and entered by Jesus baptismally, it provides that long, meandering border between the nation of Israel and the nation of Jordan. Six times have I stood in the waters of the Jordan River, about waist deep, lowering adult bodies or splashing the heads of believers in a somewhat spur-of-the-moment uh, reenactment, renewal of baptism. But all of this is just the tip of the iceberg when we think about river. The idea of river is ever so much more. In the Bible, the prosperity of the entire region, when blessed by God, is compared to a river. Isaiah says, I will extend prosperity to her like a river and the wealth of nations like an overflowing stream. On the other hand, as God abandoned a nation and is compared to the drying up of a river, the waters are fouled, the banks are parched, the fish lifeless, and the reeds and rushes rotted away. Elsewhere, the river becomes a symbol of all that is just and good. Remember how Amos cried out, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. How fitting that new life should come from a river. But for many, the river has also been a symbol of death. Our songbook is just laced with river imagery. I grew up singing the words of Isaac Watts. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Listen. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all her sons away and all of her daughters as well. This is such rich symbolism, the, the river, but I could spend hours talking about such river talk, but I keep coming back to Norma McLean. You'll learn over the time that I'm a fly fisherman, and I read everything there is about fly fishing. And so A River Runs Through It is one of my favorite books. My best quote 
in Norman McLean's book, A River Runs Through It, goes like this. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. Now, I take that to mean that the river is the thread that not only connects life, but carries it. It suggests that life's movement is not random, but directional. And it promises that life's currents are not undercutting, but are uplifting. All of this became clear to me some years ago when I listened to my brother Joe describe a family canoe outing on the Delaware River. He lives in, in New York. He said to me that it had been a while since he had no negotiated a fast-flowing river with his family in a canoe, and it took him a, a few minutes to kind of get the feel of the current again when it, the canoes got caught up and were whipped around. And he said, I found myself yelling at my 12-year-old, Emma, paddle on the right side, paddle, paddle, no, too much, too much, paddle on the left side, okay, paddle. And then I heard myself screaming at my nine-year-old, no, Colin, let go of the bench, we're going to turn over. Well, on the other side of the conversation, on the telephone, I laughed because as a minister with youth, I've taught my fair share of teenagers how to canoe. And that's how they do it. When they start, they are just frantic. There's no rhyme nor reason to their actions. They paddle hard on one side, and then they switch, and they paddle hard on the other side, just frenzied. They lurch from bank to bank and bounce off of the rocks. There are stumps and submerged rocks, and they grab hold of the branches. They are working their full heads off, the whole time shouting too and cursing at one another. <laughs> but it hardly takes any time at all to teach the kids that the river knows where to go and how to get there. If they merely let the canoe have its head and are willing just to follow the current of the stream, it only takes one deaf stroke, possibly a light touch, to navigate the journey. It's called going with the flow. <laughs> and it is built on a recognition that the river will operate in your best interest if given half the chance. The river is for you, not against you. Oh, sure, there are rocks and brambles. There are shallow rapids and dangerous depths. There are moments of being hung up and moments of being forced to dig deep and harder. But the river will send you clues. The river will see you through. It has been there, and it has carried the likes of others before it has carried the likes of you. And so Joe finished his story with this comment. Janet, what if we could believe down deep that the flow of our lives is not so much against us as for us. Dear ones, what if we could believe that the Spirit of God is in the flux and movement of our lives? What if we could trust God with the rapids of change as much as we do with the calm of continuity? What if we could begin to ride instead of buck the trends of change. From time to time, I run into some of those people that come at you contrary. Have you ever had anybody come at you contrary? You know, they not only fight the flow of the river, but they, op they not only can't find the flow, but they fight the flow. That's what I want to say. One of them even told me one time, I don't know what it is about me, Janet, but I'm just one of those guys that always like to swim upstream. <laughs> to which I should have said, well, if you're bucking the crowd or the status quo, then more power to you, my friend. But if you're bucking the leading of God, you're not only being stubborn, but you're going to miss what's happening all around you. Because, biblically speaking, 
The flow of the river is synonymous with the Spirit of God, and God is what's underneath it all. It's not music. It's not mission. It's not even ministers. It's God. God is underneath. Get yourself some of that high-powered stripping compound and take a wide putty knife and scrape the 125 years off of this congregation, off of the veneer of this congregation, and what will you come down to? God is what you will come down to. God's search for us and our search for God. And moments of connection that sometimes happen unpredictably that are both life-changing and life-sustaining. You're a pretty confident young woman, some woman said to me. Not very complimentarily, I must admit. And the funny thing is, she said this to me last year. I used to be young and I used to be confident. But along life's way, I fell off the easy waves I was riding. Things I thought would always work don't. People I thought that would always be around aren't. And if there was ever a day when I was captain of the currents, well, that day has passed. The older I get, the truer that old spiritual becomes. Sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down. But to paraphrase the title of another beloved hymn, I'm bobbing on the buoyancy of God. Now I'm talking poetically, I know. But what other way is there to talk about the providence of God, the care of God, the presence of God, which is not something to be explained, but rather something to be trusted. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that there is a thread of meaning to all of it. There is a thread of meaning to all the change that you have sustained. That there is a thread that supports and connects and that thread will see us through this season of transition and beyond. The thread of meaning, of course, is God. It's not the river. The river is just a symbol, that's all. It's not the river that runs through it, but God that runs through it. And it had better be God because the hymnal suggests that river can turn on you, which it does sometimes. The day will come when the waters will turn chilly and cold. But I remember the story that a friend told me when he went to pay a call on a man in his church who was dying. Well, it's about time for me to cross the River Jordan, the elder, elderly man said. Are you ready to cross the river? My friend said. No way. Am I afraid to cross this river, was the response. And why not, countered his pastor. To which the man responded, I have come to believe that my father owns the land on both sides of the river. As we go through change, friends, go with the flow. Use a light touch and trust that the God of the rivers is also the God of the shores, both shores. Amen.